least. Without further ado, John Connor on intuitionistic epistemic logic and propositional truncation in the type theory. Thank you for having me, and thank you everyone for coming. Our agenda is going to be a, a very brief introduction to intuitionistic epistemic logic, followed by a very, very brief introduction to propositional truncation, and then intuitionistic epistemic type theory, and finally, the reason you're all here is the categorical semantics. So we have three-fourths of the talk is logic, and then one-fourth is category theory. But time-wise, I think we'll find that the category theory uh, is, much, is much more than just uh, one-fourth. And so I think that the best intro to intuitionistic epistemic logic is uh, the first paragraph of the paper by Artemov and Protescu. Our goal is to lay the formal foundation for the study of knowledge from an intuitionistic point of view. The resulting notions of knowledge and belief, hence, should be faithful to the intended semantics of intuitionistic logic, the BHK semantics. This well-established view regards belief in knowledge as the product of verification. So, what does that mean in terms of axioms? It means this. We have... Oh, so, so the paper introduces uh, two logics, the logic of belief and the logic of knowledge. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on the logic of knowledge. This first axiom is the co-reflection axiom. It's read as from a proof of A follows knowledge of A. The second one is uh, distribution. If you know that A implies B and you know A, then you know B. And factivity is you can't know something false. And we can justify these. Uh, the co-reflection axiom is justified uh, by the observation that a proof yields verification-based knowledge. If I give you a proof of something, if I give you a proof of A, you can, you know, uh, a proof has the property that it can be verified. You can, you can check the proof to make sure that it does, in fact, prove A. Um, the other hand, IEL rejects the reflection axiom, uh, which reads intuitionistically that from knowledge of A, you have a proof of A. So it's not, um, sometimes certainly this is the case, but it's not uh, the case in general that knowledge of, of something would, would yield a proof. Uh, classically, <coughs> this is true. Classically, if you know A, then you have a proof of A. Um, Intuitionistically, what we want uh, for our truth condition is that known propositions cannot be false, and this justifies our effectivity uh, axiom, that uh, if you know A, then you know that A cannot be false. And there's some examples to kind of motivate this. Um, yeah, these examples support the, uh, the reading that A has a proof not necessarily specified uh, in the process of verification. So zero knowledge protocols. Uh, testimony of an authority. This is probably my favorite. Um, we all know that uh, Fermat's theorem is true, uh, but I would wager that none of us could produce a proof of it right now. Uh, I certainly could not produce a proof of uh, the theorem. But I do know that it's, uh, that it's true, and I know that if it implies something else, then I know that that thing is true. So I can use the knowledge of Fermat's theorem uh, and the fact that uh, something follows from that theorem to know something else. So it, it's, there's a, a certain process there. Yeah, I mean, I could prove it right now, but it won't fit in this talk. <laughs> sure, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classified sources is also... Um, is also sort of an obvious one that uh, our society would certainly be very different if, um, if say, a state actor had to prove um, that a certain condition uh, was the case before uh, it could take action. Well, this mathematician group would have to be working at the, at the cryptography agencies. The NSA, yeah. So we can't. Yeah. There's a lot less believable than from that <laughs> <laughs> And uh, last but not least, the uh, existential generalization. The idea here is you're on the subway and you have your wallet in your backpack and 
and you get off the subway, you go into the bodega to, to get a banana, and you go to get your wallet out, but you find that your backpack has been cut open and your wallet's not there. Uh, you know that you were robbed. You can't use this knowledge to find out anything about the robber. Uh, you don't know what they look like or where they robbed you or anything about them, but you know that they exist. And so we can, we can generalize from this situation to know that, that the robber exists, even though we can't use that information uh, to, in the same way that we can't use Fermat's uh, knowledge of Fermat's theorem to know something about that proof. In some way, this knowledge doesn't have any, any additional structure. We can't, we can't look into the knowledge to gain uh, anything. Okay, so that uh, is our intuitionistic epistemic logic tutorial. The next thing we'll talk about is propositional truncation. Just be clear, it's just logic with the sector of operation K at it. So when I say yeah, IEL, okay. I am talking about uh, what the paper calls uh, the logic of knowledge, and it's these three these three axioms. So no, the question was about the language. Oh, I'm sorry. The language is yeah, uh, IPC with. Okay. Yeah, right. So you have and and implication and other things. Mm -hmm. You just yeah. added this one extra yep. thing, K. Yep. That says, okay, take your logic. Okay, so what do we want to do uh, with propositional truncation? We take a lambda calculus, we add an operator that we call a propositional truncation operator, and it takes the inhabitant of the type A to the unique inhabitant of the type, and I'm going to read that as box A, uh, called the propositional truncation of A, and you know that if box A is inhabited, that that witnesses the inhabitedness of A, but it does not give you a specific inhabitant of A. So you can't use box A to learn anything about A, except that A is inhabited. Um, <clears throat> sometimes these are called, uh, sometimes these are called mere propositions to distinguish them from propositions. And there's several different formulations of propositional truncation. Uh, the first one was the quotient types of Constable. This uh, went into uh, New Pearl, uh, the, the, um, the proof assistant. Um, and I believe that they were introduced in order to uh, do some sort of performance uh, enhancements that uh, a lot of the code was carrying around um, rather large proofs that weren't actually necessary any longer. So it was after you're done using the proof, you can forget the specific proof and just remember that the thing was true and pass that around instead. So that the quotient here is you've, um, <clears throat> you've collapsed all the proofs, uh, you've quotiented them, so you just know that it's true, but you don't have that particular proof. The squash types of Hoffman, this is actually a PhD thesis, and it's, it's great, it's a great thesis. Um, uh, both of these are in um, are in Martin Luff type theory, uh, so dependent types, as is uh, Fenning's uh, extensional types. This paper of Fenning's is um, is really fascinating, and it has a lot more than just uh, the truncation in it. He has um, uh, intentional types, extensional types, um, proof of relevance. There's a lot of goodies in there, but. Um, but what we're talking about here most resembles the uh, extensional types in that paper. Yeah. And then this is the, this is the, the formulation that I'll be using, uh, uh, the bracket types of Awody and Bauer. Um, so the bracket types, or BT, these are the rules. So uh, this rule right here reads that uh, um, oh, prop X is an abbreviation of X equals box X. So this says that box A equals box box A. So if you, if you know A, uh, then you know that you know A. It's, it's equivalent. They're all, they're all the same thing. This right here says that um, uh, my, my gammas, my, I have the my gammas, my gammas fell off here. But uh, uh, it says that if, um, S witnesses box A, and T witnesses box A, that S and T are equal. They're the same, the same thing. So all, all inhabitants are equal. Now this is, as I said, an independent 
type theory, Martin Luther type theory. This is an internal notion of equality right here. Um, and the type theory that we're going to introduce, we don't have an internal equality, and so we'll have to deal with that. Uh, this is the um, box introduction. Uh, you, if you have uh, A of type A, then you can truncate it, where you just you forget the term A, you forget what's inside of these little lines, and it uh, is a witness of box A. And in particular, because of the previous property, if I had a B that witness that I truncate, I get the same thing. You get the same thing. There would be, yeah, that you'd be in this situation here. And this tells us that if B is a proposition, so B equals box B, um, and you have a witness A of box A, and you have a witness B of B that has uh, a free variable X of type A, then you can replace that X with that A right there, and that will inhabit B. So you can, you can take that variable out and stick that term in, to get an inhabitant of B. So this is the elimination rule mm -hmm. for the box. And the bracket types are characterized by these three properties. Uh, there's a canonical, uh, uh, the semantics, you know, this is, we're in semantics now. So uh, there's a canonical arrow, A to box A, that's natural in A, uh, and that box A is equal to box box A and that near propositions are exactly the Cartesian idempotence. That is, if A is equal to box A, then A is isomorphic to A cross A, and uh, the other way holds as well. And, yes? In, in, in general, the, um, the canonical arrow, if you repeat it twice, it doesn't give you, or it does give you, it is idempotent itself. It's got to be a potent definition. Not even potent or is even potent. Uh, the canonical, the, the, this guy? Yeah. I mean, is, uh, is, yes. It is even potent. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Yes, how can you, uh, how can you sure. prove that there aren't any more Cartesian item potents? That sounds surprising. Well, Ah. It's that they they would be propositions. I mean, if if it is a Cartesian idempotent, then it would be a mere proposition. It would, um, it, you might it, you might not have constructed it to be so, but it would behave as one. Um, it would satisfy uh, everything that a mere proposition had to had to satisfy. So if you go back to the pre previous page, put any Cartesian idempotent in all those. Well, the only way to get the only way to get um, the only obvious way I should say to get the equality between between a and bracket a is to have constructed a as a bracket type itself. Um, is there uh, top the uh, canonical inhabitant of top? Would you consider that to be? Like bracketed. Yeah, I mean, because that 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 satisfy the top the, the the inhabitant of top would satisfy the the uh, Cartesian idempotent uh, property, and it would behave as if it was a mere proposition. But we don't typically, you know, box top. So I think another way to say that is you can view all of them as being produced by a localizing of that equality. Mm -hmm. sort of. yeah. But but it's but if you just defined top, then it seems like you wouldn't be able to prove that that it is equal to to bracket top. If you, um, one more time? How would you prove that top is equal to bracket top? Well, because you, well, what you first have to do is produce bracket top, but what you would actually show is that top is a ready uh, bracket model, and therefore uh, the bracket operation on top is identity. <laughs> and, 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 and so it would follow the other way. I would, I wouldn't prove that they were equal. I'd probably prove that they were, you know, 
unique up to unique isomorphism kind of thing. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, how would you? Um, yeah, uh, they, they would. They're, e they're as equal as it gets. How about that? <laughs> Yeah, but that's not necessarily equal enough unless you're in like higher or homomorphism type theory. Um, or sorry, homotopy type theory. Uh -huh. Well, that's what this says right here. I mean, yeah. the uh, where that, that that's the condition here. So yeah, uh, but 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 that's true for top. But but I don't see how you would prove top equals bracket top. I mean, you could. You could prove top isomorphic to bracket top. I mean, uh, so, so when we're talking, so when you say equal, uh, I'm not sure what equal you mean. I mean, we certainly can't do it inside of like it's, this is not what we're going to do is not a Martin Love theory. Like we don't have an internal yeah. notion of equality in which we could. Well, even even well, even there, I'm not sure how. But but there's not. So we'd have to be a meta. Uh, proof that they were equal, and we, I'm sure that we could uh, we could agree on a, on a yeah. On well, a proof. in the original in the original setting, it was a Martin Love type theory. Though. In the yes, in the original setting, it was, uh, and in the original setting, you can. Although I don't know what proof uh, they would. They would so, have. so is the Cartesian other book property in the Audi Bell kind of proof? Yes. Okay. So okay. The answer is we should look it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me be clear. Uh, yeah. So. I don't, this is from their paper, um, this holds for, uh, this characterizes, but right now all we've, we're talking about is the bracket types, uh, this characterizes um, bracket types, bracket types are characterized by the following, so bracket types as, as described in their paper are characterized by these three things, we're going to find that what we construct in a simply typed lambda calculus also satisfies these three um, properties, uh, but no one, uh, to the best of my knowledge, has done propositional truncation in a simply typed lambda calculus. So there's not something that we can point to and say, ah, yes, uh, obviously this is uh, this is propositional truncation. So I'm using these three properties to show that the calculus that we uh, cook up here is um, has a propositional truncation operator. Um, but uh, something, yeah. So, so to answer your question, how do you prove that that top equals box top? I'm not sure how you would do that in the uh, in the bracket types formulation. And do you want to do you want to do it in ours? Because right. we could probably do that at the end once we have the rules for our system. Then we would be able to. To well, actually, you, you know, try to, yeah. to prove it, but I haven't introduced the rules yet, so it'd be it'd be hard to prove it. I have a technical question: What's your estimate of the amount of alcohol that would be required? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Well, well, how, how much uh, do you I, got? I, I think we've got this question. Yeah. Yeah. Please forgive. Yeah. 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 <laughs> sorry. The North Pole joke. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> twice as much as you got. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, that is our crash course in uh, propositional translation. <coughs> um, so now, in this section, uh, what we want to do is establish the equivalence of IEL with an idempotent modality. Um, so this is set different. This is not the IEL that we just looked at. Now we want to make the, the uh, modality idempotent, and we want to, um, to a simply type lambda calculus with products and propositional truncation. So we're going to we're going to prove this equivalence. Uh, and how we're going to do that is we're going to assume a simply typed lambda calculus with products. Uh, we're going to extend that to create two new calculuses, uh, intuitionistic epistemic type theory and intuitionistic epistemic type theory plus. That one has the, uh, the idempotent modality. I call them it and it plus. <laughs> Uh, and then we're going to extend the curry howard correspondence between IPC and STLC to a correspondence between IT and IEL, and between IT plus and a modified IEL with the night of modality. And then, finally, we'll show that uh, the IEPT plus rules are admissible in BT, and that the BT uh, rules are admissible in IEPT plus. And 
that I so that's we have two justifications that this is um, that this is like truly propositional truncation. This is the syntactic one, and then the uh, the semantic one is what you just saw. Where one could prove that uh, Cartesian idempotent deal. Uh, so, in order to define a lambda calculus corresponding to a logic, we need to encode the logic's natural deduction derivations as terms, and this is our rule. Um, this rule is weird looking, and right now I'm calling it co-reflection introduction. Until a few weeks ago, I was calling it co-reflection elimination. <laughs> uh, um, certainly, if you uh, look in the literature for things similar to this, um, uh, Topavia has something called um, uh, constructive K. There's also some systems called, um, oh, well, uh, constructive uh, S4 has something that looks very similar to this. But uh, in any case, there's usually another rule that goes along with this, that an introduction rule, and this is usually the elimination rule, but the introduction rule is just a special case of the elimination rule. And I believe that this, um, so certainly everything that we're going to do today, this uh, works just fine as, uh, as, an, as an introduction rule. It may be that this, it may be that you need to consider this an introduction and an elimination rule, or maybe it can go, it has to go like between the introduction and elimination rules. Uh, I have not, I have not uh, learned all the secrets of this rule yet, but for what we're doing today, uh, introduction will be just fine. So how do I read this one? I am, we'll, we'll tell you right now. So <laughs> if you have um, some assumptions, gamma and delta, mm -hmm. and from those assumptions you can derive an A, then you can, you can discharge some of those assumptions, however many you want, zero, a uh, uh, hundred, whatever, um, and that's what this is. We discharge these assumptions here in gamma, and then we introduce a new assumption. For, for each of those assumptions we dis discharge, discharge, we introduce new assumptions, but these have a leading uh, k in front of them. So this is, this k distributes through, through, uh, through delta there. And then down here you have ka. So if you were able to derive a, then below the line you have Okay. So this is exactly what the guy was doing in this proof checker where he said, okay, we don't need, we don't care about the proofs of these hypotheses, so we have to oh, no. truncate the conclusion as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to show that this rule is equivalent uh, to the Hilbert system that we saw earlier, and we can derive the uh, two axioms, uh, two of the axioms for the Hilbert system, like so. I won't make you read these, but um, this is the co-reflection uh, introduction, and this is the distributed. Uh, dis this this is the distributive one. Um, so we can derive the two axioms from the Hilbert system. So certainly it works in that direction. Um, the other direction holds, but we'd be here all night, and the proof is real fiddly. So we're going to skip that part. Just wondering, just the first one, which doesn't look too huge. Sure. How does that? Is it quick to describe how that Absolutely. works? Absolutely. Uh, let's, let's take a look at it. So this is the special case that we were just looking at. Um, this, this you start with an A, okay. and mm -hmm. you derive A from A, mm -hmm. um, and you don't discharge any of the assumptions. So there is delta uh, here oh. is empty. Mm -hmm. And then, so you have A, K, A, and now it's just a normal uh, discharge uh, uh, arrow introduction. Um, to get A implies uh, KA. Does anything interesting happen over here? Let's see. Ah, so let's just look at this, the first three parts. Here we have um, A, and A implies B, and from that modus ponens gives us B. Um, and now we discharge this U and V. So here, there's no gamma, there's just A delta. Um, and so we get these two new uh, assumptions here and we get our KB here, and then we just discharge those two new assumptions. So uh, this is the special case where there is no delta, and this is a special case where there is no gamma. But in general, you can, you can, have, you can have something in gamma, have something in delta. Well, presuming that the, the other direction is where you have to show that all these, that for a general gamma and delta, you can always break it down into these four things. In the, the other direction for the... Um, the other direction in 
requires in, induction on the structure no. of context, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Uh, what four things? You said four well, things. Well, the four oh, things that you're Oh, the four system. different, yeah. Uh, That's like the four things your Hilbert system are all mm -hmm. you will ever give it the most arbitrary gamma and delta yep. because induction, yep. that's all you'll ever need to, to break it down to repeatedly doing these four. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's and In this case, I'm glad to truncate that for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's just uh, the testimony of an authority. Just uh, <laughs> The Hilbert style systems are notorious for being impossible to prove, it, to work wow. out. They're very good for specifications. That's why mm. mathematicians who are not proof theories they love them. Because you just list the F axioms because that's a Hilbert style system. That's it. And you don't specify how you build the proofs. Yes, you deal with models. Yeah. But if you really have to, to derive something, mm. then you forget the first thing you do, you forget about Hilbert style truth. Uh -huh. You go either natural deduction or something. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you prove one system and another, it's both syntactic translations. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is especially easy because you work in a rich system. Mm -hmm. But then, as you properly guessed, uh, in the other direction, you have to prove a lot the, uh, the, 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 um, the adequacy of the, of the scale rule mm -hmm. in the Hilbert system, which is a headache. Mm -hmm. So good choice, truncate this. Mm. And here's our... Uh or IE, PT rules. Um, our introduction rule, that is really ugly, isn't it? I find that this notation is, is kind of the worst choice of notation for anything. Because I mean, it, it's just all vertical lines. <laughs> but uh, this is, uh, oh, we're now doing it in kind of the, how type theorists do it, right? With the sequent style uh, natural deduction. But this is what we just looked at. This is this is the, the same the same rule. It's just here we have this is delta here. All these x1, a1, xn, an. That's all the stuff in delta. And from that we can derive a b. And then these are the the boxed assumptions. So this is all the boxed things that were in delta. And then down here, I'm keeping the uh, the little the two bars to indicate that it's uh, that it's truncated. And we just replace, so this is for all i. You know, we replace all the xi's with the ai's, mm -hmm. and we put these little bars around so that we know that, we, that we've done this. Mm -hmm. um, that's our introduction rule. Um, and we have the computation rules that, so we have that bottom is equal to box bottom, um, and this is, uh, this is by, by fiat, you know, to make the, um, to make the factivity rule work. Um, and here, oh, this is our uh, uh, if, S, uh, if S inhabits box A and T inhabits box A, then S is equal to T. So this is the same uh, computation rule as from the bracket types. <clears throat> oh, and I'm going to just use subscripts instead of stacking up these uh, lines that we would have to count. Jeff? Where, where does the equality lie? Is that oh, oh yes, thank you so much. Uh, this equality is a judgmental equality. I was playing around with using you know, the hamburger, but I decided I'll just leave equal signs okay. everywhere so that we can all be confused about what kind of equality we're talking about. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so this is a judgmental equality. This is the big difference between um, this system and bracket types is that uh, this is a, a meta thing that's happening here. And then IETT plus gives this additional rule, and this just says that if A is a type, then box A is equal to box box A. So this is this is one of the conditions uh, for, for for bracket types. So if that makes the modality item potent. All right, so we're going to do uh, Curry Howard. Uh, we're going to extend the Curry Howard isomorphism. The correspondence between IETT and IEL. Um, so we're so we're just going to assume that uh, that the um, assumption markers and that the um, and that the variables uh, the context variables are drawn from the same set. Otherwise, the notation becomes ridiculous. Um, 
And then we're assuming uh, that this is an isomorphism between the types of STLC and the formula of IPC. And then uh, we're going to extend it. This is actually part of, of, of the, actually, I, it looks like I say, let it be, and then I do it anyways. So anyways, uh, so we, um, phi of some variable x is just equal to the variable x. Phi of top is just equal to top. Phi of bottom is equal to bottom. And then phi of a cross b is phi of a and phi of b. And phi of a implies b is phi of a. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so we have um, this arrow is not implies. This is the, uh, this is the lambda calculus arrow. This is the implies. So uh, if we have a function from a to b, then we translate that to uh, wherever phi takes a uh, implies wherever phi takes b. Um, and then, this is what's new, we do it for IETT, so phi takes box a to k, and then wherever phi takes a. And we want to get this little phi, it's a, we're going to assume that we've already done this for uh, simply type lambda calculus, and IPC, and then we're just going to extend it to deal with the new IEL uh, things. And uh, as by induction, the base case is an STLC uh, derivation. So there's only two rules that we need to worry about, and neither of them can be at the top. So uh, once we deal with these rules, whatever is above them, we assume is an IPC rule. Oh, yeah, uh, assumption is an IPC rule, and every assumption has to be at the top. Um, okay, so let uh, gamma delta uh, term style A, uh, and A here is a normal form, and then let T be truncate that and have uh, delta equal box delta. So uh, this is the, we've, we've truncated A. So if we take phi and we map, we map this term, we just map it to wherever delta goes, and then k and, excuse me, did I call that delta? Wherever gamma goes. And then k wherever delta goes, uh, turn style k uh, phi of a, so that's that a right there. And then, so that's, that handles t. And t had this a inside it. So now wherever, this is now the base case. Now phi operates on that a, and we go up the tree, and we have assumptions, and then we're done. Um, the other, is a term t prime of type bottom. Oh, okay, so informally, you know how this works. We, we have absurd t prime, and that is, uh, inhabits any, any type that you want. Um, so here, let's say that we have a derivation that t inhabits uh, box bottom. Then we extend phi, it, uh, we extend phi to be absurd t uh, inhabits a, so this, this gamma here uh, gives you A, this gives you bottom, and then this is the, um, this is bottom equals box bottom right here. So we use that equality to turn, because T here is, uh, inhabits box bottom. So we use that rule to turn that box bottom into a regular bottom, and then we're just back. This part is just standard IPC reasoning here. And I think we actually do a full-blown example of, of this one uh, in particular in just a few slides. So if that was horribly confusing, then we'll see it in action in a minute. Um, okay, so we're done. We've extended uh, phi to be a homomorphism of normal IETT terms to IEL derivations. Um, so that concludes that part of the proof. What's next? Ah, we need to... Um, <coughs> We're going to show that IETT plus uh, rules are admissible in the bracket types, uh, and that the bracket types rules are admissible in uh, our IETT plus system. And I claim that this justifies uh, us calling our system propositional truncation. Um, but there's another justification as well, a semantic one. Uh, Jay, did you? No, have no, no, I'll, I'll wait till the end of that. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 okay, no, 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 hit me now, hit me now. So, do you have an example where you get non-trivial topology out of this system? 
I don't know. Okay. Uh, well, wait. Well, I know that I don't have an is, example, but I know. But uh, uh well, but I, I think the other well, question I was something similar. I was thinking is that. Propositional truncation, huh, is, is is interesting to the extent that you have, you know, something uh -huh. that, you know, you have a circle and now you have a point. So, yeah. you know, so the question is sort of, you know, what are you truncating away? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's um, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So, uh, you mean because in, not in the plus system, but in IETT, we have, we can truncate as many times as we want. And so you're wondering well, if well, that well, question is different. I'll, I'll give you the background. Two points, and now you have a point. Yeah, no, I think that's about it. You can talk in a way set up. I'll give you the background to the question. Last year, I understood the simplest case of the Curry Howard. Oh, okay. So okay. I'm very interested. So now I'm going to try and do some topology with it, because I'm going to try and write something up. And I don't see any non-trivial topology with the simplest case, which corresponds to IPC. Um, I don't see any topology. So now looks as though your system would give me, by a slight extension, not a slight, it's a very serious extension, but still you're going you're to call it simply typed. I'm going to get any topological space if it succeeds, I think, any ordinary um, first week of topology 101. I get any, I get any simplicity of complex, for example. Is that true? No. That would be great. Well, I don't think that's true. You want to get some social complex? I want to get it. Come on. It's, uh, I don't think that you got You level. got Okay. I think there's well, only set level data. This can only eliminate that. I, own, I only I convinced yeah. myself that it wasn't easy for me anyway to get a non trivial topology by working with STLC and Curry Howard. I don't know enough about okay. what, how yeah, you, I'll, I'll what give your you approach is, but I'd be happy to talk but to I, you. But I hit this like within the past month, which is the mm -hmm. reason I'm so excited. But but, uh, but I'd like to answer a question that was that I thought that you were asking uh, instead of the one that you asked, and that's uh, you know in a homotopy type theory we have n truncations, right. and that does not seem to correspond to to like I E uh, uh -huh. L. Uh, that uh, yeah. it's not there's not um, there's not a higher truncation. There's just you yeah. just have one truncation, and the point is you can do it. You don't have a proposition necessarily that. Doing it once is the same as doing it twice, but you, you don't necessarily have an example where it's oh. not, right? You just have a case where you can't prove it because you don't. Is that? No, I, I didn't right? follow that. Uh, so that's right. well, the. Let's let you do your sure, thing. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, it's a, this is something that I, that I pursued for a while, trying to understand if there was some sort of connection there, uh, because, you know, we're calling this truncation, mm -hmm. there's these end truncations. There doesn't seem to be any kind of relation between the two. There's no, but maybe, maybe there is, but, okay. but okay. certainly it's not an obvious one. Okay, uh, we can eliminate, oh, yeah, so this is the easy one, right? The introduction rule. Uh, we, can, uh, we can take the introduction rule, um, and we can, uh, it's admissible in IETT+, um, we eliminate these uh, derivations with derivations that look literally exactly like them. It's, it's just the, uh, it's just a special case. Um, so this is the case where there's no, there's no, box variables over here, and we're not replacing anything inside of the little truncation thing. It's the case where, you know, delta is empty. It looks exactly the same. So this one is admissible. Um, this one, this is the elimination rule uh, from the bracket types is admissible. Um, and now this gets, this, this is why I justify it two ways. I, uh, we're doing, we're doing this syntactic uh, justification, we're also going to do a semantic one. Why? Because this right here um, is an internal equality in the bracket types uh, system. We don't have that. So we just have to interpret this as a judgmental equality. Uh, so we, when, we, when we take the equality and we reinterpret it as, as a meta you know, thing, uh, then this works just fine. Um, we have a special case where uh, th this matches this, this matches this, and then we just rewrite this and we, we truncate here, um, and we have, uh, we have box B here. Now you're saying there's a, bo a B here with no box and a B here with a box, but remember that we're in IETT+. Plus, and so box, box B is equal to box B. And so this extra box and these extra 
uh, truncations, they don't mean anything. It's, it's judgmentally equivalent to removing them. Um, so this is admissible, and really it, it's admissible even if this condition here doesn't hold, because they don't truncate down here, whereas we do. So we can take in a non-proposition, and, and at the end we have a proposition. They're enforcing that as a proposition on, on the way in, but um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, this, it's, it doesn't matter if this holds or does not. We can. They're, they're going to be equivalent. Um, the introduction rule uh, is it, so this is our IETT plus introduction rule is admissible in BT. So this big long nasty thing, uh, we can eliminate it with this. Um, I don't know if you can read that. This is um, we just do one. And normally we're we're allowed to. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is we're going into BT. This is the BT rule. So uh, box B is a proposition. That uh, is true. We don't need any anything above it. That's a rule. Um, this thing right here is just one uh, one box. And here is the next one, and then on the next line it would be A3, A4, and so on until AN. And we just do them one at a time. So we just we just do the replacement one at a time. We go from from one to two to three to N. Um, and at the bottom here, we've replaced all, all x1 through xn's with all the b1 through bn's. And we did have to truncate this n times on our way down, but it doesn't matter because they're all equivalent. Um, the reason that we have to do this is so that we end up with the right context at the bottom. If we just did it once, yes, it's true, the term that we derived is equivalent to the term that we eventually get, but we have all this extra stuff in our context. We would still have... Uh, x2 through xn in our context if we just did it once. So we do it n times. And so that rule is admissible. We can interpret this with this. Okay. So that was kind of cool. Uh, and now we're at the part that I think everyone was waiting for. Yes, <laughs> category theory, that's why we're all here. <clears throat> so we're going to sketch the categorical semantics of IETT and Cartesian closed categories equipped with a non-idempotent monad interpreting the modality. <sighs> and then we're going to verify that adding the IETT plus rule results in the same semantics, but the monad is idempotent. And, uh, and that the modality now corresponds to truncation. Okay, so what's required? Uh, we all know this part. I think that we need we need some sort of syntactic map that takes a type A to an object A, uh, a context to uh, a product of, uh, of those uh, objects, and to a derivation, a morphism, uh, a from gamma to A. So this is a uh, land back. Yeah. Oh, and then I'm not actually going to write these brackets, except on one slide I write the brackets because it'd be confusing otherwise. But we we all we'll know we'll know if it's an object. So now or, these brackets just mean yes, go the into the category. Yeah. yeah. But a category, not the bracket. Either. Right. Oh yeah, 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 I know. There's too many. There's too many brackets. Brackets already. Yeah. Right. Brackets all the way down. Um, so uh, this is just the you know the normal definition of a monad. But the reason I mention it is that the literature always says something like a modality is generally interpreted by a monad. Um, uh, most of the literature says that. A monad has to be, excuse me, that a modality has to be interpreted by an idempotent monad. Uh, and they seem to be, most of the time, uh, I've never seen anything in the literature uh, that used a non-idempotent monad. Um, there is, uh, well, NLAB, for example, as a little aside, says 
Hey, it doesn't it doesn't really have to be uh, item potent. Um, I think Mogi in uh, in his paper uh, also mentions that it doesn't have to be uh, item potent. But um, but certainly, uh, if you if you pick one at random from the literature, it's it's item potent. Um, I've seen people interpret them by adjunctions rather than. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah. well so, I mean, that's the same. Thing. Like, that's the it's just like, wearing a different. When you're in a topo setting, you really want the item potent because it yeah. uh, it gives well, you a topology. Yeah, for, because then it gives you a it gives you a topology. It's very set, and but I think yeah. when in a more general setting, you don't need it. It's just yeah. I, I will say that the I could present the the modality different than than I do. The reason that I choose this presentation is because in the literature I've seen several places where they say, oh, and this is so simple that the modality is not interpreted by uh, a monad. Instead, it's interpreted by just an endofunctor. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to assume an endofunctor, and then we're going to see that that implies this, this monad. So I, I think that it, if you see this endofunctor, you can't, you can't stop there. You have to keep going and seeing if maybe there really is a, a monad in there somewhere. Um, I think you're missing a mu someplace. Am I missing a mu? You have it on the top line. Yeah, but mu goes from t squared to t. Yeah. So oh, you're just saying you didn't write the type of oh. mu down. Oh, oops. I didn't write the t, right? No. Yeah. No. No, I mean. Well, I guess with the where you didn't, you wrote the type of eta and epsilon, but didn't write the type of mu. Oh, we didn't write the type of mu. Oh, but you can infer the type of mu. <laughs> no, but, but it doesn't go that way because it's, you have to swap your l's and r's or something like that. After what's what? Uh, mu goes from t t to t. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. You need. Yeah, you got it down right on the bottom. Yeah, you but are you used to saying it should be in the where? Yeah, but yeah, it should be r dot l. Right. Oh, this. Yeah. This should be r dot uh, r composed with l. What? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Oh. For a monad, you make the free thing and then you forget it back down. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The free is left. Mm -hmm. Anyways, go on. Far uh, further. We know what a monad is. Fine. Yeah, you know, because I always think left should go on the left, uh, and it should. It's just that the kind of, that it's backwards when you, yeah. Uh, Hypermatic versus, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Good eye. Yeah. <laughs> That's because I'm looking through the radio camera. Okay, yeah, so there's a couple definitions that we need first. Uh, in general, you know, the whole purpose of IEL is that you can't unbox something. If you have box A, you shouldn't be able to uh, unbox, you shouldn't be able to get the A out. Um, if I tell you that Fermat's theorem is true, like you shouldn't be able to take that knowledge and be like, oh, of course it is, and, and write it right out the well, proof. Well, it took somebody 300 years to rediscover it. Or, <laughs> or to just discover yeah. it. But, but um, uh, now, uh, Professor Fitting raised an interesting point um, to me. He said, well, if you tell me that Fermat's theorem is true, then I would just start brute forcing. You know, like, like if I held up a page that this is a proof and then threw it in the fire, you'd be like, well, it was one page. I could probably, you know, brute force that. <laughs> um, so there, there's, there's something to this, and we'll look at, you know, how, how, how far can you get this way. Yeah. But you can't, get, you can't quite get all the way there. Um, so you can't, you can't just unbox arbitrary things. But you can do this, you can replace the K with a double knot. Mm -hmm. And this is the proof <laughs> that you can. I won't make you read it, but I just wanted to put it up there in case you thought maybe I made up that you could just replace the K with a double knot. It's true, you can do it. Uh, it's just a little laborious. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What about the other direction? <laughs> yeah. Can you turn double knot into knowledge of A? Can you, so I, 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 you'll probably want to beat me up after after this, but I just informally in my own mind, I sometimes read the the double negation as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so a good intuition is it's a classically true with an initiatic environment. Double negation means classically true. It means that you cannot have a counterexample 
Right. So this is the best approximation. To climb. In particular, uh, on the technical side, you can prove the double negation of all classical pathologies, but you don't have knowledge of all classical pathologies. So, so my, my intuition is that it's, it, it, it's an axiom that one could add that not, not A implies KA, but, it, it's, but it's not derivable in the system. Not derivable, and yeah. it, it will change the system. Right, right. They want the K to be somewhat weaker than that. Yes, yep, then, that, that, that was the point. That, is, yeah. that was the point to place the knowledge that's thing right. in between A and double right. negation yeah. of A, and uh -huh. that's why it took. Mm -hmm. It's a delicate difference, but it's mm -hmm. still very significant. No, yeah. Sure. Uh, but if, so if, if you have not on A, <laughs> You know that you might be able to find a proof of A, but you know that you will never find a proof of not A. So it's possible you will find a proof, which is different from knowledge of A. So from the possibility of finding a proof of A, that does not give you knowledge that, that A has a proof. I think of A is the lower exclude middle. Right, right, no, no, exactly. Well, I was going to observe that topologically, like you can view not not A as, I think, Topology yeah. or something yeah. on, on A and uh, yeah. and then that stands mm -hmm. then K of A is, mm -hmm. stands in the middle. Well, that's right. Because so I guess the context for that is that atomic topology is. Well, that's right. So context for as a topos theory, you know, this thing by there where you interpret the double not as a modality, which as you said gives sure. you that particular topology. So it sounds like you'd be saying is yes. So you've this got K a, would be a weaker got a, little of theory. You've topology. got a topology that sort of sits indefinitely in the middle of, of the atomic topology where you can tell every proof of Bard and the chaotic topology where you absolutely can't. And here you really don't know uh -huh. if you can or not. So it's yeah. synthetically... So which leaves a middle. lot of opportunities for the yeah. logical models. Well, it's, it's a lot of relationships. We should take around for 10 model. minutes. Although I think we're talking about two different, different types of topologies here. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. When I went to try to do it. Onward. Yeah. 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 Are we all confused? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Excited. Good mm. deal. Right. Uh, so I denote this this thing right here uh, as epsilon, and maybe that's giving you a clue already as to how our monad is going to go down. Um, oh, there's that thing, and then so uh, the. I looked all over the literature to find who, who did this first. I mean, I'm just saying, like, it's well known. There's a couple things I just say it's well known. Because, you know, when you spend two days trying to figure out uh, this, it's just, it must be well known. If, well, if that's anyone's... not a version of your case that's been used for a long time. <laughs> and, uh, there, there is a functor, what we're calling G for Glavenko, um, taking an object to its double negation. Um, and, uh, yeah, all those... Um, all those arrows assemble into a um, natural transformation, and we're just we're doing that as a as a lowercase gamma. <coughs> also for Lebenko. <coughs> mm -hmm. And it's also well known that uh, <coughs> for any object A, an exponential not not B. There can be at most one morphism from A to not, not B. <coughs> That's the sub. So uh, not not B is uh, double negated terms are subterminal. Okay, so here we want. Uh, here's our interpretation. Uh, we want a map which interprets. Uh, we have this category C, and it comes equipped with a map that already we can do simply type lambda calculus in this category. We're just going to extend this map to do. The rest of it. Um, we want, and these are these are conditions. Uh, we want a functor k taking a to box a, mm -hmm. and then we want an epi natural transformation uh, from the identity to k, which interprets our truncation operator. Um, and I make the following identifications. You don't have to make these. These are just uh, you make these if you want everything to fit on a piece of paper or a slide, because otherwise you get a lot of a lot of negations floating around out there. Uh, so yeah, uh, four negations is the same thing as having two negations. In other words, uh, g squared is g, and we can move the uh, the negation inside of the box. We can move it outside of the box. Uh, so kg equals gk. Yes. Is k an endofunctor of something or not? Yes. Yeah, it's an endofunctor. Okay. Uh, g and k are both endofunctors. Okay. They both. Uh, yeah. So. 
So these objects live inside the category. We're not going somewhere else okay. for them. Like just Nando Fontar takes that contracts things down to a smaller. Yes. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, so you might be like, well, why is K epi of kappa? Why is kappa epi? Well, are you doing some sort of, is this some sort of subterfuge that's happening here? And it's not. Uh, we can be in this situation where we have uh, x of type A is free, um, and here S, uh, we're replacing this U with box X, and we're replacing this U with box X, and this is equal and they're both of uh, type B. Um, and so if we take a U, and a U is a, a, you can infer the type of U here. So if we just take U of type uh, box A, then S must be equal to T. And so that's the exact same thing as this, where if you take S uh, and you replace the free X with a U, that's, that's equal to T, where you replace the free X with a U, and that means that S and T are equal, and that's just the definition of an epi. And so uh, this situation right here justifies us requiring uh, kappa, uh, yeah, kappa right there, to be epi. Uh, what, what, what does epi mean in terms of the logic behind it? I mean, I know what epi means in terms of the categories, but what does it come from? It comes from now, why are you happy to show that it's epi? Oh, I'm not happy. <laughs> Do I look happy? Mm, you look like you're <laughs> physically <laughs> pain. I'm not happy. No, I do, uh, because it, um, I don't know, it's like, I'm like, oh, and hey, also we need an epi, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, why do, why do we need an epi? Where, where's that coming from? I just want to, I just want to show that that's, that's not like later, I'm going to be like, and, and everything works because it was epi. I mean, there's, there's a, a justification for it being epi. Um, what does it mean? It, it means that, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I don't know what, I don't know what answer, I don't know how to answer your question because I don't know what answer would make me happy. Make you happy. Mm -hmm. um, it, this rule right here is, uh, is an equivalence. It, it's saying that if, if these things are equivalent, then these things are equivalent. And that's what this means too. Mm -hmm. It means Thanks. that if this is equivalent, uh, if this and S is equivalent to this and T, then S and T are equivalent. So here we're saying if this is equivalent, then these are equivalent. So it's just that it's just two different. We're just using this this logic uh, to prove that these two arrows are are the same. I just want to understand. Sorry. So you're saying if I take one of the axioms you had mm -hmm. in the logic side, I interpret it with the semantics. I get an equalizer diagram, and since k is equalized, it's an epimorphism. In fact, a regular one. Is it regular? Well, by definition. Because, because it equalizes. Oh, okay. I mean, regular just means one that happens yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. equalizer right. with something. And okay, but it's yes. how it shows up. Is that yeah. an equalizer or is it just a fork? I mean, well, well, it's so like a, it must be. It's so theoretically, like an, an epi, it's morally non to, right? And that's just sort of what it what, Which is what you would hope. Well, something well, that's contract and wouldn't right? be that, uh, that, that, That's sort of what I'm saying. Is it's the category of theoretic moral equivalent of it has to send everything to. The same then place. it wouldn't make it enough more for me. Right. Okay. Further. Let's yeah, go. I would love to talk to people about this because I have like a stack of papers where I'm trying to work out a oh, lot okay. of things that you're talking about. So I, I'd, I'd love to continue that conversation. But, but, and he but, will at 8:30. Well, intuitive, intuitively, I guess it's saying that that this that this um, kappa of truncating should, as a way of truncating, should be almost surjective. It should not make too much more stuff true. Sure. But formally it's just one of the substitution yeah. rules which are which make life easier. Mm -hmm. And yeah. will probably play some role in the further development of the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'd like to prove that this is sound, so I'm going to give you how each of these terms are interpreted uh, in the category. Okay. Um, 
So for it to be sound, we need a canonical <coughs> interpretation of I, E, T, T, and C. And we need uh, a term T of type F. With, oh, well, oh, where's it? Well, now we're doing F. Oh, with three variables in gamma, maps to a morphism uh, like this. And then if two terms, S and T, have the same normal form, then those morphisms are equal in the category. Uh, and so we're just going to... Uh, Okay, yeah, so this one is just a special case. This is the, the, the special case where um, we're doing the truncation and delta is FD. Uh, so we have this normal derivation, and it's just interpreted by the composition of A and this truncation. So gamma, A, truncation, and we already know that uh, truncation A is equal to kappa sub A, because that's how, that's how kappa is defined. So this is just an easy peasy one. There's nothing uh, to show about uh, anything commuting here, but in the next one, uh, we have something slightly more interesting. So same rule, just more interesting. Um, we have this normal derivation, uh, and T is equal to, so we had some term S, and we replaced all of its uh, deltas with box deltas. Um, this is a pullback. So this is, uh, this is S uh, goes to A, and then we truncate A. This is we box all the things uh, in delta, and, that, and then T takes this to box A. So this commutes, and you might wonder what's, what kind of stuff is back here. I, I think of uh, just permutations you know, of, the, uh, of the context are one obvious thing. Uh, that this uh, extensions do right. Ex oh, of course, yes. Extensions, permutations, like yeah, you know, I just picked the factorization of you know uh, gamma and delta because it looks pretty, but there's nothing special about this. I mean, the, the, any of them would do, uh, and that's that, that that is sometimes a bit of a headache. Um, but yeah, because I mean, it's only up to isomorphism, so any any of them would do. But this does commute. And, oh yeah, this is the one I promised you way back when we were doing Curvy Howard. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is the other rule, the effectivity. So we have, we have this. Um, this is, the, is really the term we want to interpret. Everything else is pretty much IPC, but we have to, um, we have to do it all. So here we have T. Uh, is uh, a box bottom, and this is just the, uh, the, the, the what it has to be. And then we have absurd T, uh, but there's no bottom in here. But uh, by assumption, uh, C is a model of the simply typed lambda calculus, which implies that it would commute uh, if this was just the regular old bottom. And by factivity, we have that this is equal to the regular old bottom. Uh, and so absurd T is equal to uh, bang sub A composed with T, just as one might expect. And so the diagram commutes. And th those are the only two things that we need um, to interpret. There's uh, only two rules here. Uh, everything else is handled by the assumption that uh, it interprets SPLC already. Oh, I thought I took this out, but this is just this gets this. Uh, I just like looking at this. I think this is pretty. This is everything in a nutshell. Uh, every one of these is just a, a single morphism. Uh, as this is epi, but uh, all these are are two uh, subterminals, and you can. Um, I don't know. I think you know. This is. This is a terminal, this is initial, there's all sorts of, you know, it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun diagram to, to look at. It, it, it's got, it's got it all. It's E equals M squared. It is. It's, <laughs> it's, well, it's, all, it's, all, well, it's all you need, it's right, right there. <laughs> all right. Oh, okay, I, I'm not going to give you a proof of completeness. I'm going to state what completeness would mean. Uh, there exists an IETT category, C, such that all of its morphisms are 
terms, and we might call that the syntactic category, and in all models of C and some other category D, if F and G have the same normal form, uh, then F is equal to G in that arbitrary category D. Uh, proving this is long and boring and there's nothing interesting happening, I feel like this is true of categorical semantics that the interesting one is soundness and completeness is just like, is, is there ever anything interesting that happens in a completeness proof? I've, I've, never, I've never seen an interesting one. The next thing uh, we have to do is construct a monad to interpret the modality. And I just want to throw this up there because this is how I approached the problem uh, initially. And you can't really make this work, but you can find all sorts of really fun, uh, fun things out like this. But I just want to show that this type of thing just can't work. Um, we can always get, like, so we can start with with T, and we can just take some theorem, and then we can box it as much as we want. We can take the unique morphism back to top, and then we can just go to right before it. And we could call that unboxing. Uh, that certainly works as long as what you're dealing with are theorems, then you can always go back to top and then find your way back. And there is some choice, maybe like A or A prime, but you can actually show that that choices are irrelevant, that they're all equal. Um, but, what do you do in the case mm -hmm. of non-theorems? That's, I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's where it all kind of falls apart. There's all sorts of interest. You, yeah. can, you can build a million different monads if you just consider, yeah. you know, theorems. And so, this is also uh, not a trick. I put these little hats on top of our G and our K, and I think most people wouldn't be this pedantic, but I just want to make sure that, that we're all clear on what the, um, on what the uh, codomain is and what the domain is. So we're just saying that G hat, it's, it's the same as G, it's just that it takes the objects of C into the subcategory induced by G. And K hat, it's the exact same thing as K, but we're only considering it uh, taking things up. Uh, really, we just want it to be from C to C, but in, in order for the, these to match, we say it's coming out of the subcategory induced by G. And there you go. Whenever F exists, this F here, whenever you can go from not not Y to not not X, then there's a unique morphism G, uh, and I'll say what this is in a second, that makes this whole diagram commute. Um, does anyone see what we're doing here? The, when I first figured this out, I just thought it was such a gimmick. Uh, I thought this is this isn't interesting, but I, I have come around. I now think that this is very interesting, and I, I think I understand the difference now between the. Oh, I, I think I think I get what's happening here now. Uh, for one thing, I was very surprised to see that G was the left, uh, right? I mean, I would think that K would be the free um, functor, and that G would be the forgetful. Um, no. No, well, if you, if you, if you, I mean, yeah, if you disagree, that's great. You have better intuition than me. I, I thought that it would be the other way around, um, and uh, and it's what we're what we're doing is we're just saying, hey, in classical logic, we could take the box off. Let's just go to classical logic and take the box off. I mean, that, that's all we're doing. We're just we're just making the jump into the we're doing the Glavenko double negation translation. And then we're taking our, and then here we're, we take our box off. So G is just uh, you double knot the Y, you take the F, and the F, you know, so if the F exists, then this G exists, and then you just uh, put a uh, put a box on it. So we go here, here, and then we just don't see the box morphism right there, and then. Epsilon is just that unboxer that we introduced a little while ago. Yes? So the conditions you gave before on K were enough to determine it up to, up to uh, isomorphism? Why are you asking? I mean, what, what, what's the... Or is it because G 
actually has like a hidden dependency on what k is. What, what, does g have a hidden dependency on k? Is what you're asking? Yeah, because, because, because k should be, as, as a right adjoint, it should be determined up to unique isomorphism by g. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're asking if I have given enough to do so? Yeah. <clears throat> I think well, let's go back here. Wee. Oh, I didn't know we left her back. Um, and we're we haven't get, so this the, I I see I, I see the problem yeah. No, I, um, as, I, as I said earlier, there is a different way of presenting this, and I didn't, I didn't perceive this particular objection. I perceived other, I, I foresaw others, but you know, the, the reason that I'm presenting it this way is to show that these conditions give rise to uh, the monad, that if you assume, uh, if you assume these rather, uh, you assume this functor and this natural transformation that that's enough to give you this monad. I could have defined this another way. Instead of making these conditions, I could have defined them in terms of universal properties and so on, and gotten, I think, uh, what you're after. But I did not do it that way, specifically, uh, to show that the monad arises uh, just from these rather weak assumptions. But uh, I can show you the universal property that I think that you're looking for. Um, it's not on the slide, but I can do it on the board or something after if you'd like. But uh, it, it exists. You, you can determine it. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think if there's something here uh, in the slide that would show it, but I, I, but I don't think so. But you, you can, yes. But... Um, I think we're done with this slide. So, so what... To, to state this, what you did, what you did is you gave us an endofunctor k, and then gave us an uh, endofunctor uh, g, which is the double negation endofunctor, and you showed that uh, you can construct your endofunctor k as a factor as, uh, as yeah. an adjoint uh, that, uh, that, that so factorize it into an adjoint uh, right. with g hat and k hat, and therefore k is a monad. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. I did this specifically because people say, oh, it's just an endo, and uh, it's just an endo functor, uh, we don't need a monad. But so if, you have, have, if you have an endo functor and these rather weak things, then you do, in fact, have a monad. Um, but uh, we're, I think we're, we're done with this slide. And the next slide is this corollary where k is and where you have a Frobenius um, adjunction, if you further restrict the domains, if you, um, if you go from the subcategory induced by G to the subcategory induced by K, and the subcategory induced by K to the subcategory induced by G, you do this. And there, and just there, you have this Frobenius adjunction. And I don't know enough about Frobenius uh, adjunctions or monads uh, to figure out what this means, and I've been reading up on them, and it's rather, I mean, I, I think this is used a lot in uh, topological quantum field theory, and I know that some people in here are interested in this, so I'm hoping uh, that I can beat some answers out of you after this talk. Uh, but this is interesting to me. I don't know if this is, in, uh, if this is meaningful or, or, or what it means, but there is one more. You can do this as well, uh, and so this, this you can bring back to the full category, um, and so here you can get uh, you can get your um, your K on the left of something, uh, which is nice. I'm not going to use these. I'm just pointing them out because I think that they're cool. Oh yeah, so. 
since exponentials are of the form double mod a, you know about diagrams can be. That it's not interesting. We just have uh, we just have our our knowledge we had. Um, okay, so the thing that remains is truncation. Uh, we have to show that in the presence of the prop rule, the monad is idempotent. Um, so if we say that box A is equal to box A n for all positive n, then this just becomes ID. Uh, and that just follows from the equality rule. Uh, any two morphisms from box A to box A are equal in particular ID and kappa. Uh, from this, G2 equals G. Oh, from this and the equality, uh, it follows that uh, eta is idempotent, and therefore the monad is idempotent. And so we've done these, uh, so this is, I think, the last slide. Uh, so from the rules of IETT plus, we have these two conditions already. We have the canonical arrow uh, by, by assumption. I mean, that was one of the conditions uh, for our category, is that it came with this canonical arrow. Um, and then this is uh, our rule where, where we've identified these things. We have to show this uh, Cartesian idempotent thing that had us wondering earlier. And it's just a simple diagram chase. The only, uh, the only time that this diagram commutes mm -hmm. is, if, uh, is, is when A is uh, a truncated, uh, is, is a truncation. Um, the, what, the outside is, but which line is it? The A, uh, the equality is here. The outside is here. And oh, and I have to use lowercase delta for the diagonal because we are already using the uppercase. Does that answer your question that you had earlier about the? Uh, uh, no, it doesn't because you wanted it, to know. For it, it answers part of it, but the yeah, other part it, I the other part I answered by looking up Ali's paper and finding out that they don't use that definition for prop in their paper. Well, they do in section seven. Did you? Uh, they so they mentioned yeah. They use a different uh, they use a different definition throughout the majority of the paper, and then in section seven they give two different um, two well, different. I mean, specifically for the elimination rule, the version they use is is not, is not just that they explicitly spell out proof of relevance, but they spell out proof of relevance in the specific context that you're going to substitute the variable into. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're going to give something to a constant function, you can you can then give the truncated version. Yeah, the, I I think that so they give a couple different alternative formulations in the. And I believe it's section seven, uh, and this is one of the alternative formulations they give. I liked this one because it was easier to uh, it was easier to interpret in a simply typed theory. But they they, they claim that it's uh, that it's equivalent, and I believe them. Um, okay, I think that's just yeah. You know. So. Any questions? Any unhappiness? Any discussion? I've got a uh, a rather uh, large speculation about uh, future work that probably uh, would be in the far future if you ever because there's plenty else to do. That's very interesting. Uh, which is um, if you look at uh, Shulman's paper on a uh, real cohesive homotopy type theory. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look like it would be relevant, but it is because the first three quarters of it uh, deals with uh, sort of uh, modalities and co-modalities in a very abstract and general way without actually getting into, before he introduces the real numbers and actually does Brower's fixed point theorem in it. Uh -huh. And doesn't, isn't, that, aren't, isn't that all idempotent modalities? I think well, yeah, but you, you have an idempotent one lying around here. Uh, um, yeah. so, but the point being that he shows, uh, the, he has got a lot of neat constructions where he shows whenever you have a modality lying around, you can sort of trivially construct a, a co-modality that uh, sort of has nice adjoint interaction rules with it. Um, mm -hmm. 
it's not a very interesting one because it comes directly from the modality. And then at the end, the magic trick is then he sort of inflates that co-modality with content by some other axioms to, you know, give it a relationship to the real numbers and do stuff. But you could also do something else with those sorts of co-modalities. And in the setting, what I think it would, that what, what you should have is dual to the notion of, uh, dual to the notion of things that are knowable. So you have things that are provable. Now, in, in the, I guess in my understanding of IEL, right, like it, a, the ambient things are provable. But you can have things that have restricted provability, right? They're, they're linear provable or provable yeah, under. Yeah. So, so, and, yeah. and then they should have dual rules where, you know, if it's linear provable, then it's provable. Yeah. Sort of, you know, like provability logic style. And those are the extractive ones, and they're smaller. And so I would suggest that in general, you should be able to set up a modal comodal relation that complements this, that you could start to back into using Shulman's constructions. Um, and discuss the interaction of knowable things and, you know, provable things in some subset that are, you know, again, some, some restricted notion of provability. Yeah. And, and yeah. you would have some interaction rules between the knowable and the provable things that yeah. would be basically the general adjoint modality of the system that Shulman and Mikado have set up. Oh, okay. So, again, it's suggestive, and, but uh, there's a lot of stuff you could play with without doing serious work that's suggestive if you just look at his axiom setup. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a I'll take a look at the at the paper. Uh, I remember skimming it, and um, it's yeah, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty deep. Well, is, is that a blog? That's his blog post, actually, right? That you're talking about? No, no, no. It's a seventy goddamn page paper. Uh, he's got a blog post about it. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I read the blog post about everything. the paper. Yeah. Well, well, well the point is that the paper does a lot of stuff that's very general, and it's a oh, okay. introductory exposition to a lot of general stuff before real numbers enter the picture. And and if you stick to the general stuff, then you can get a lot of ideas. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? I, I probably completely misunderstood the assumptions of this question are due to my misunderstanding. It looks to me as though you've shown that whatever setup you have, you don't get higher truncations, or have I just misunderstood? No, I, I don't see them. I tried to find them. I mean, there, there's nothing, there's nothing okay. interesting that happens there. It's just, uh, it's just, uh, it, it's a, uh, there, well, in the last case, it's a reflective. Subcategory, but in um, but generally there's there's nothing interesting that happens. Right. So no higher structure. No higher structure. Eight. So yeah. This well, and there's, that, well. and there's nothing that and there's nothing like but, and there's nothing that becomes equal. Like and there's not like um, right. it's different the first ten times you do it and the right. eleventh time. Well, then well it's, also then the, the repeated equal. truncation is repeated one truncation, and even in the hot setting, that's all. It impotent, as he says. It's, repeated it's what, what truncation? The, 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 what he has is repeated truncation is repeated one truncation. Sure. Something. And those are all as impotent. So, yes. so the, like, what you would actually want is a higher notion right. of truncation, which right. is a different indexing than he has. And then one more thing that's not a question, but a remark. Yes. If you if you do along the lines that you just told me the paper by Shulman and Ricotta, I have believed for several months that one can get arbitrary or near arbitrary topologies out of that approach. There's enough there. I just mentioned this. Uh, where are these topologies coming from? What are you doing? Well, as I say, I understood Curry Howard for the simply type lambda calculus, and it's an astounding result. Sure. Because it's a persuasive explication of the notion in one very simple, very particular, very special case of the age-old question of when are two proofs the same. It gives a clean example, namely that in this case, lambda conversion of terms is complete for the functions they compute are the same functions. That's the completeness theorem. Mm -hmm. So now we have an invariant of proofs in this system, namely the function that the lambda terms could be parameterized by ground sets, by ground types. That's an astounding result because it's clean, right? Okay, so now you look at it and you say, well, we want something more. We want two proofs. We, you want to do a round trip. You want to show that this proof and this proof are the same, and you want to do a round trip and then you want to get holonomy, obviously. Okay, so that's all. So, but I, I can't see any way to get it except maybe via oh, Shulman Lakata. I see why you want approach. I see why you want simplicity. Well, I, I want topology. I have simplicity. 
know, whatever it is. You, you, want, you want, want the structure of the proofs. So you, you want holonomy. What I'll observe about this system is that uh, in this system, uh, by, because it's built as an extension of sort of STLC, uh, right. uh, you've already got cut elimination everything built in, so it, 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 it's too late to look at the structure of the proofs. Um, the, the structure of the proofs is computed away for you. So, it's very so I never thought about that. But so when you want to look at the structure of the proofs, you need to look at a finer grain lens. The thing that I f focused on was, in your talk, was this little thing, there's a claim, the, the bracket thing, there's only one thing in it. That, well, that, of course, you hard to get too much topology out of that. There's only like one thing after you apply this transform. That's all. I, end of rant. Sorry. There's only at most well, one thing. I'm oh, sorry, at most one thing. Absolutely. You could have zero Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. There is, um, <clears throat> you can defer placing that equalities rule in, yes. uh, until IETT plus. You don't need it in IETT. Um, and it depends what you're trying to do. If you, what you can do is you can put a weaker rule there, and this is what I have done. You can put a, a weaker, you can use two weaker rules. You can put a weaker rule in IETT, and then another re, e, uh, weak rule in IET++, plus plus oh, okay. when together, combined, they give you that rule. And this is actually what I've done uh, elsewhere. Uh -huh. Just, it makes it simpler for a presentation uh -huh. to use that rule. Oh, okay. When you do that, you get that. Um, you get that from. You get that from coming, from. Uh, if if you go from an unboxed term to a box term, there's one way that you can get there, but if you go from like a two box term to a one box term, there may be, there may be other paths. Uh huh. Okay. okay thank you. I guess that that relates. To, I sort of have a philosophical question that which is to see in the. In the meaning, intended meaning, and whatever of um, you know uh, this system, um, right about reasoning about knowledge, um, um, are there cases in which you really want to be able to distinguish between oh. KA and KKA, and and, and 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 how would that work, and, and what could you do with that? Uh, I think that's a question or something like that. Um, I can answer it from the, the epistemic yes. angle. Between Wiles says yeah. it's true and... Mm -hmm. Basically in between, and so Kirk if you look says at that... Wiles says it's true. <laughs> right. The, 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 that's, that's how I get the mixed messages from the type theory people. Mm -hmm. Because um, some of them believe it's, uh, it's the rule and some of them believe it's not. And the difference is so you have the, there is one only one inhabitant and then truncated time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it know? Does it is it fixed? Mm -hmm. So the fact that you know that this this is truncated time mm -hmm. uh, is inhabitant does it give you the specific witness, mm -hmm. or you still not it's still not enough knowledge to recover the witness? Mm -hmm. And this is exactly the property which determines whether you have k double k uh -huh. uh, wow. uh, implies k. Because with double K, you know that the, the type is not empty, then, uh, but you need a witness. Do you have a witness out of this knowledge or not? Mm -hmm. If you have, then it applies uh, simple K. Mm -hmm. If not, then it doesn't. But this is, a, uh, in the, epistemically, it can go either way. It's like in model logic. You can assume this, you can uh, walk without it. Mm -hmm. It depends be, on the color, but this is a kind of issues you have to settle. It would be interesting to look at this in the in the case of zero knowledge proofs. Yes. <laughs> yes. And yeah. say, can you have a zero knowledge proof that something has been zero knowledge proofed? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, that, that, that's a good point. So that, uh, so I, uh, I I have to do a little bit more homework on the epistemic side. Yes. Uh, can we first thank our thing, and then we can bother him till twelve o'clock tonight? Thank you. <laughs> Just following up something I said earlier for a record, it would be interesting to look, you know, at topos because we said there's, you know, in the first example of laboratory apology, one finds as well double negation. As a modality, and say, what would be a topology that would give us the K? And for example, they could ask, well, would there be one where the K, you know, could, where KK is not K or 
Well, it's sort of, I mean, that, that, that is sort of the hot scan point, because it's all yeah. done from factorizations and modalities and the right. higher Douglas theory, and, and then this is sort of but with this logical with a, version of it. Or this with just an ordinary topos, perhaps, you'd have it where I take the same one where I uh, you still have double negation. You still have ordinary topos, so it, sure. you're still in sort of an NLTT setting. It's just okay. <laughs> Oh. I'd kind of like to know what that what that universal property is actually. Oh. For K. And we stop.